that is uh, the impact of digital transformation on creative leadership skills. And, um, and I always start with the survey table why yes, the Serepa da l'Herbe du Moi Paysage, Madame Guardo Trezier, in the sense that uh, the, the true research uh, uh, um, uh, is a journey is not just to discover new countries, but to have uh, new eyes. So we need to, to learn to have new eyes, huh? to discover new things. And so the, my presentation online is uh, organizing with the five points, the digital transformation, system transformation, creative leadership skills, disruptive impact on creativity skills, and conclusion. Um, uh, so the, I just a few words for what, what is a, a, a digital transformation. It's just a, pa uh, the, a passage from economy, economy of, sca of scarcity to economy of abundance, uh, from atoms to bits, in the sense that uh, when you have uh, just uh, one uh, prototype that you can replicate uh, uh, with bits uh, many times as possible as you like, uh, uh, creating a digital twin. And then, uh, uh, then you can apply uh, technologies like AR, augmented reality, or VR, virtual reality, to exploit uh, as much as possible all the possibilities that you create in the, this uh, virtual environment. Uh, but uh, just to give you as past examples uh, of digital transformation, think about uh, newspaper. You see the impact on the market uh, when uh, a digital uh, printing was introduced. A, a, a a, a there, and then for digital cameras, you see just uh, you know the, the, the market uh, revenue going down uh, deeper and deeper as soon as you introduce uh, a, a digital transformation in specific market and uh, so for music and so offer uh, you have to know uh, to be careful about offers versus demand scarcity is gold abundance is commodity the market value decreases and so right now, uh, digital transformation are in, uh, right now uh, are at this level for different uh, sectors, uh, different markets. Uh, music is 100% digitalized, uh, travel 70, 70%, entertainment 50%, 20% manufacturing, LKR 10%. And so you will see later with the presentation of uh, uh, Dr. Alberto Folletti uh, how uh, uh, digital transformation is impacting healthcare, that is the most needed uh, uh, sector uh, right now. And uh, we have different penet penetration by sector, by geography too. And so we have uh, a new system, ecosystem grow. I have no time to go into detail of this one because I prefer to use my time for the, the, the uh, better, better topics uh, later and uh, and then uh, we we uh, we passing from value chain uh, uh, to the value chain uh, concept in the past uh, efficiency was just the key to uh, get more value uh, through continuous innovation little steps to to gain efficiency and, and so increasing value but now we're talking about uh, value chain evolution, like uh, uh, perceived value and innovation in parallel sectors uh, with concurrent innovation, strong deployment control, share control on route, scale advantage, competition is uh, on price. But then, this, this was the reality uh, since the turn of this century. Right now and tomorrow, you see out of field innovation, margin and not deployment control, measured value creation, intermediation advantage, competition is on these models, not, not on uh, object any longer, just on biz business models. And so just to give you a mark, a, a, an example that is quite clear, is computer marketing. Dramatic cost reduction expanded the market from mainframes to mini to led to the disappearance of Univac, Bell, Siemens, and so on. From mini to PC destroyed uh, DEC, uh, VANG, and so on. And post PC era crisis hit uh, IBM, HP, Dell. And we'll see in a few years what will happen. And so a takeaway value chains are macro processes, competition happens within and across value chains, competition decreases margin, margins, competition shifts efficiency benefit to an end uh, consume, uh, customer, disruption changes the value chain. Done. System transformation. 
Now we can use this kind of approach to have more tools to augment humans' capabilities or machine capabilities. And, uh, and you see uh, there, you have humans, you have machines, you have uh, all these kind of tools that you can uh, augment the function for humans and machine, and they are converging through this right uh, path that is uh, to arrive to symbiotic autonomous systems. And uh, if you like to go deeper in that, I recommend you this, this, this book. You can download this book from uh, from internet. Uh, it's, uh, it's free. And so I, I, I think that uh, you can get a lot of inspiration from this because uh, you see in that book you will find augmented machine technologies already selected with the hype, the, the uh, Gartner hype, hype uh, curve associated by color and then uh, augmented human technology, same with the uh, uh, Gartner hype, hype, cube, uh, associate, hype uh, curve associated, and then uh, symbiosis fostering technologies uh, just to reach the uh, right side of, of the premium schema. And so this symbiotic relationship with tools leads to humans 2.0 and beyond. And so you will see augmented humans, humans 2.0, and then uh, you can uh, just uh, unleash your fantasy, uh, and somebody is just uh, talking about transhumanism, uploading your cautions on, on a machine. Can you imagine that? Okay. Thank you, Kurzweil. Good luck. <laughs> but then it's better to use uh, our resources to just to solve seven grand challenges. Those seven grand challenges are just the fusion of the previous 17 challenges of GDP, GDS. Uh, and so uh, I think that uh, uh, in this way, uh, just uh, they can become more manageable. Uh, but then we have to just uh, go a step further in learning. We have to leave silos, silos by behind. Okay, otherwise no solution will be available. And so creative leadership skills, then we need uh, an inspiration. The inspiration is the day science begins to study non-physical phenomena, it will make more progress in one decade than in all the previous centuries of its existence. Such an inspiration. You know the, the guy here. <laughs> huh? But then, uh, uh, the, the inspiration just forced us to go to this, uh, this diagram that is uh, usually to solve a problem, we focus our attention on, the, on direct space formulation of our pro problems only. We don't take into consideration the co-direct space, the reciprocal space, and reciprocal co-space. So at best, we use hopefully only 25% of information that, to solve our problems. Is that correct? Unfortunately, it's not. We use even less than that because uh, uh, we don't take into consideration the other three parts, so we completely ignore all the relationships. So it's not 25% at all, it's just uh, maybe 80%, and if we don't even take into consideration the cross relationships that allows us to make the jump that Tesla thought about. That is the jump from outer universe to inner universe. You see the green horizontal line, no? Separating the representation of the outer universe, direct space and co related co direct space, and the inner universe, reciprocal space and co-reciprocal space. And so, continuous learning from outer, you see outer universe is our brain, and go inside, inner universe, inside our brain. And then we can enlarge a little portion of that brain that is uh, uh, just uh, around the central sulcus in this way and see all the relationship there of the, uh, our neurons on the, on the, on the cortex uh, and see there on the right side uh, the, the uh, perceptive uh, uh, components uh, of our representation and on the left side the motor rep uh, 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 representation that was already known from the 50s um, by Penfield and Rasmussen with the, the homunculus. But then now we have a more precise vision of what that representation is. But then think about what is this? 
This is the cerebellum. Anybody told you that the cerebellum just uh, is made by 82% of all neurons that you manage in your body? 82% are there. Our quarters uh, uh, have only 17% of, of neurons. And, but all our attention is focused on our cortex only. So wise. <laughs> like, like uh, you know, focusing our attention on studying say, different, different substances and, and, and absolutely wiping out all the information about the water on our body. That is the main component and, and, and a major uh, important component of, of our body. But anyway, this is the usual approach, was the past approach. So what is physical and what is non-physical? Huh? At this level. And so we have just to take, uh, to remember that we have to take, I already presented this slide uh, uh, in Rome, uh, this, at this conference in Rome, where it's just uh, saying that we have to remember to use all our components of our mind, that is the intellectual and intuitive and emotional, emotional and instinctive, okay? All together, all coupled together. And to arrive to the collective intelligence to overcome individual limitations for common well-being. And that's, uh, I think, the next step, you know? We have to work together uh, uh, to arrive to the quality of quantity, from quanta to qualia. Each quantity has a specific quality. We didn't think about that in the past. We assume that all the quantities are just the same. Good luck. Disrupt impact on creativity skills, okay? Observer, c'est pour la plus grande part, imaginer ce que l'on s'attend à voir. So, to observe for the major part is just to imagine what you are already expecting to see. If you have this kind of attitude, you will never discover anything new. <laughs> Thank you. So, what is this? I already presented this, this joke. Uh, in the past, uh, so for a few of, of you already know the as well, but uh, I elaborate on that. So what is this? I just turn upside down. What is this? Now. A river. But, you know, in previously presentation, you had a little difficulty to, 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 to discover that it was a river. Why? Because we don't take into, into consideration gravity polarization for our observation. Our, all our observation are biased by gravity. We don't take into account because we stay with our feet on the ground. <laughs> but gravity polarizes our way, the way we observe things with this, this kind of, a, of a frame, a reference frame. And in fact, the previous image that I presented you was using a different frame, representation frame. That's the difficulty that you you felt in, in, in the recognition. But then, to extract more information, we need both of them, combine it together. And then you see that we need both of them with the six orientations, six basic orientations, fundamentals. And then, when you use all the six, you discover that there are not direct lines, they are a conceptual abstractions that we use on the, on the real. Is that correct? No, asymptotic abstractions are just abstra abstractions. Okay, so rotation implicitly define associated line orientation and oriented lines implicitly define associated oriented orientation. And uh, I, this is too technical, but I, uh, from a scientific point of view, we already know that uh, we take into consideration with the geometric algebra this kind of property. But this kind of property is global, it's not just local. And so, if we apply at the, at the global level, we discover that this property just originates from Leibniz. From number of components given by Leibniz combinatorial partitioning formula. So we can use the partitioning formula to learn about the combinatorial side of orientation. And when, then we discover that those orientations, you see the Leibniz, uh, the, or the Pascal triangles, the way you like, or the, uh, there are many names for this one. But those ones, that, that, that is something that you discover immediately, as I discovered uh, 40 years ago, that those are, are just the powers of 11. 11 
122, 1, So are the components of, of the power of 11. And then if we associate this kind of uh, knowledge, we discover the combinatorial side of orientation with point, lines, surface, volumes, hypervolumes, and then we arrive at any di dimension we like with a computational approach that is solid, that give, give you exact error approximation. And then we will be able to compute the space-time tesseract. You see the vortices there. Do you remember vortices by Clark Maxwell or something? Somebody like that, huh? you see? But now we are able to compute locally, point by point, was the kind of behavior. And then the same framework is just at the basis of our narrative proficiency. If you take into consideration the existing uh, logic cognitives of PERS, then, or, or just the other uh, 16 uh, relationship of the elementary pragmatic model, then you see there, this is the Rosetta Stones, they connect the, the kind of, uh, of spatial orientation with the, our uh, narrative capability, with the colors uh, perception, with color perception, with the frequency associated to that. So we arrive to our conclusion that uh, traditional mathematics has really a big, big limitations. The, the first one is the continuum, uh, continuum hypothesis assumption that, that uh, is giving you assuming infinite, infinite, infinite precision by default. Life is a compromise. If you give infinite precision, that you lose orientation structure. That is the most important one for real life and you have no, cons no information conservation, dissipation, total dissipation of information. And so now, now we are in, in, at the level to, to follow two different models to understand our reality. The past one, that is by default, systems are simple, some of them are complicated, occasionally systems are complex, which the systems are exceedingly rare. This is the traditional approach, the Newtonian approach. Or by default, the new one, systems are complex. Simple systems are limiting cases, include the complicated system. Complex systems treated as if they were simple tend to generate with the problems. <laughs> ha. <laughs> so the quality of quantity, big data versus deep unity. Big data analytics versus deep unity, wisdom. And so we have two different modeling approaches. The past one, big data, just a separation, the usual uh, silos approach. And then, and then you have this kind of, of uh, focusing on in, inner matter best operational representation compromise, a representation space endowed with full flexibility. In fact, you can use your imagination to develop any model you like. They are all unreliable. Good luck. Uh, simplify system dynamics framework, Newtonian approach, to model any geometrical space and monitor system dynamics behavior only. A spectator, a spectator, can become a system in natural perturbation. So we put aside any, any humans from our models, you know? Yeah, it's simpler. Uh, or the deep unity approach, you know, the unity wisdom, that is the one for living matter best representation operational compromise and out our representation space, one-to-one -one linked to our inner representation space. Natural system dynamics framework, quantum field theory approach, to model projected relativistic geometry and to anticipate emergent system dynamics, an observer, this time not, not a, a spectator anymore, but an observer, a eh, human being becomes an observer, can become even a system natural co-artifacts. And then you jump from the past to the future. I propose this kind of approach to, you, you will remember, uh, Roger Perros, Rupert Sheldrake, Federico Fagin, uh, Jerry, Jerry Pollack, and then to Luc Montagnier, that uh, right now is just waiting to, 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 to start a, a new project uh, to, uh, to discover the imprinting properties of water. If you would like to know more, 
for December, hopefully I will finish my book. <laughs> this, is, this is a commercial. But never forget that the, the worst enemy you have to fight is yourself. Good luck. Okay. okay, so now we are ready to continue with uh, Mariana uh, Bozesan, that is president of Aqua Foundation, uh, based in Germany, uh, a representative of the Club of Rome, and uh, we present an uh, 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 interesting paper on, uh, or presentation, Education in the Singularity Era. Uh, an investor's approach. Well, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here, and it's a great pleasure to follow your speech because you basically provided the foundation for the thinking that I started to have back in the late 90s. So let me give you a little bit. What qualifies me to be here? Is this the right mouse? Okay, thank you. So what qualifies me to be here? I'm not a professor anywhere. I'm not an educator. <clears throat> and if this works, then yeah, I will, be should be able to. Um, I'm a computer scientist, but I'm not able to change this now. <laughs> this way. So, the, okay, so I won't be able to, oh yeah, it works. So what qualifies me to be here, I'm, um, I'm somebody who's tried to implement what, uh, what it's Rudolfo, right? It's um, yeah. Rudolfo, uh, tried to, um, well, theoretically explained in, from the point of view of physics and uh, quantum physics and uh, bigger picture. And I asked myself this question back in the, in, uh, in the late 90s when um, I became wildly successful in my investment as, a, as, in, as, a, as an entrepreneur. I, uh, in the mid-1994, uh, we saw my husband and I lived in Silicon Valley. Uh, we were, um, I was lucky enough to be, become an exchange student at Stanford and uh, I came across Mosaic. And Mosaic was the first browser and to my husband and I, who is also a computer scientist, we saw, wow, now something big is going to happen. The world is going to change because we had known the internet and we knew, wow, let's take the internet to Germany, which we did. Only to, to find out that nobody knew what the hell is the internet and uh, nobody had internet access. And so anyway, so we solved this problem um, and uh, started the first internet company that went public on the German stock exchange. And uh, because I was born across the border from, uh, from here in Romania, I, um, I grew up bitter poor. I went to school without food. My toes are crooked, my teeth are broken um, because I didn't have the right anything. My, we only had an outdoor bathroom. Um, and so when you end up um, having an, an exit, an IPO, then you say, oh my God. Um, and then all of a sudden, um, my marriage started being on the rocks. I thought, are we gonna get divorced or what? Because uh, we could not integrate that poverty. So if you're poor, you wanna get out of poverty and all of a sudden, all this stuff, whatever. And so that was the first time when I asked myself these questions. Like what takes transformation? How do you uh, integrate the inner with the outer? And this presentation of mine is basically trying to show you my journey as a, a serial entrepreneur and an investor that is actually trying to do this exactly in the investment world, in the business world, building what we call integrally sustainable companies. And um, I, came across the Ken Wilber's integral model and no, nobody actually know, I know a few people in the room know, um, as a model that helped us, helps us integrate um, the, the true, the good, and the beautiful. The, the Greeks already had it, um, and, uh, but we actually eliminated it over, I don't know, 300 years ago, Descartes helped us, and before that we only had the church ruling the world. So this is basically what helped me um, become successful. And the reason why I'm saying I invented this uh, theta model in investing and I put the 6.8 return on investment is not to impress you. 
I put it down to impress upon you that if you integrate people, planet, and profit with your own passion and purpose, you are also uh, scientific, um, financially successful. And so this should help us get those people who believe that you have to make money at the expense of everything else. This is, in my own little, small, very insignificant way, we were able to prove the opposite. And uh, so, again, uh, my background is artificial intelligence, but, and I studied that back in 19, in the early 80s, um, but I had to go back to school to get my PhD in psychology, actually in transpersonal psychology, uh, because I needed to stand on two feet. I needed to learn how do I take this thinking, how do I take this thought into investing? And I just had a conversation with Lisa Petraitis, uh, who basically told me that she's actually experiencing in the educational world that we're trying to transform here, what I had experienced back in 20 years ago when I tried to apply this in the investment world. How do you change the system in a system that is already rotten? Rotten in a sense that we either have the opportunity to transform education as an NGO, uh, or as a for-profit, which is what's currently happening. And so the structures, the systems that we have, we need to change them because otherwise you can't put it forward. You can't integrate, you can't make that transformation. So this is maybe a way to do that. So um, my intention is what is the context in which we operate and uh, the other is what is the key to transformation, and of course we've already all uh, heard that, and what is the future of education and the role in what I see. And by the way, those of you who are interested in going into more detail as to how um, I'm doing it, there is a, a panel that I'm gonna give a little bit more insight uh, tomorrow. So what is the context? We have already heard that we have three major th threats. It's climate change, is um, Artificial intelligence, Ray Kurzweil, although I, I think he's a very smart man, and uh, technical singularity, so, and then AI in, applied a nuclear threat. So it's not that simple. And being a member in the Club of Rome, uh, we get told all the time, yep, yep, it's climate, stupid, let's do it. And uh, it took us 50 years uh, not to achieve what actually Greta Thunberg achieved in a year because the time was right. And the question that I ask myself as a, as a company builder, as an investor, how in the world am I taking this, am I applying this into the everyday, like you, when you teach? How do you do that? Day in and day out. These are big thoughts, but how did, you know, I, I still have a physical body, how do I work? How do I um, have an impact? And so, these are the questions that I ask myself, and uh, we have on the global level, we have two major achievements, the Paris Accord and the 17 UN uh, SDGs, but there are 17. And if you talk to people, education is one of them, they would tell you, oh, I pick one, three, and 11. What about the rest? Don't we have to implement them all in order to be successful? And last year during the Club of Rome event, in, that we had in, 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 at the Vatican. The um, Jorgen Renders, Rockström, and other amazing, amazing people um, came up with the paper that I highly, highly recommend. Um, and I do not agree with Jorgen Renders, by the way. Jorgen Renders is one of the in, in, initial authors, one of the four authors um, who wrote Limits to Growth back uh, in 1972. Um, but he says, uh, what we are doing is too little, little and too late. Well, if that is true, let's kill ourselves. And I, I won't do that because there is a bigger picture. He does not know. He is not connected to the inner side of himself because otherwise he would not dare to take us the hope away. And I'm here to give us hope. All of you are probably here to give each other hope because that's what we need. That's what's gonna take us further. So how do we integrate within the, how do we integrate UN SDGs within the context of exponential technologies? And we know from Peter Diamandis, tomorrow's speed of change will make us look like we're crawling today, and that's true, unfortunately. And how do we 
take such exponentially growing curves, this is uh, back in the mid-90s when uh, we took the internet to Germany, uh, this is the slide that we show people how the internet was growing. That's the exponential curve. And if you go deeper, this is what's actually changing our world. And this is a representation for our human ability not to get it because we're linear, local thinkers. But technology goes exponentially and acts globally. So this is the major challenge that we have as humans. And this is a major help that will come through AI if applied in a proper way. I am convinced of that, and we need to join them. If you can't beat them, join them, and this is what I'm doing. And what is this? Who has already seen this curve? People in the Silicon Valley have already, yes, of course. This is the evolution of technology over the past 100 years. And most people say when they refer to exponential tech, they refer to Moore's law. But if you look at it, Moore's law is new. It's only the fifth evolution. So what I'm trying to tell you here, this exponential evolution of tech has dozens, has not seen any wars. We had several wars last century, major, two major ones. You can see that. What this tells me, people will continue to provide the dollars, the money, to evolve this technology because it's exciting for many reasons. So let's join them. Here is another, so it's uh, electromechanical relay, vacuum tube, transistor, and then integrated circuits. This is a, a much more readable uh, slide for that same statement. And uh, of course, the five, the six Ds of singularity, everyone is familiar with them, I, su I suppose. Um, I need to go a little faster to keep within the time frame. And here's the report that I refer to you and that I highly recommend. And I would like to, um, to thank um, uh, Jürgen Renders and Rockström for giving me these slides because this is research based on data that's been collected over the past 50 years. And they have done a new simulation that help us implement the UN SDGs within the next 11 years. And here's what they came up with. The most important thing is to implement the UN SDGs within planetary boundaries. There is no point in picking and choosing number one, no poverty, which is what the, you know, the Chinese have done and the, the North Koreans and so on over the past uh, decades and implement no poverty at the expense of the planet number 13, right? So we need to work together. And so this has to occur within the planetary boundaries and you see there are nine of them. I won't be able to go into the details, but that contains the ocean acidification, biosphere needs, you know, the operating system. We need air to breathe. And so the UN SDGs need to be implemented within planetary boundaries, but if you look at what we're currently doing, we're not doing this. And this informs actually my action, my activities, my investment decisions every single day. So if you look at, um, on the y-axis, you see the number, uh, the nine planetary boundaries. This is an important slide. If you go away with one slide from my presentation from this session, this is it. If you look at the planetary boundaries, there are nine of them. And you see at the top, there is the green at nine. And at the X um, axis are the UN SDGs, the number of the UN SDGs that are implemented at any one single time. And what we want to do, we want to operate within the green colors. Green at the top and green at the, at the, on the right-hand side. So we want, want more planetary boundaries being fulfilled and more UN SDGs being implemented. So what have we done? What have we, in the 1980s, we started implementing, this is the data simulated by, uh, from, uh, from the Stockholm Resilience Center. So in the 1980s, we were still operating in the green planetary boundaries. Then we started going down the tubes. And if we continue, we will be able to implement by 2050 about 11 UN SDGs. But we will have left, and we already are there, the planetary boundaries of the planet. What happens, and this is the simulation 
um, of the uh, Stockholm Resilience Center based on the data collected over the past, past 50 years. What happens if we move faster in this direction? We won't be able to achieve much more. The same will occur if we move harder, and you can find the details on, in the report. But there is a way, and this is what gives me a lot of hope. There is a smart way that will be able to take us up uh, back into the operating system of the planet that uh, will ensure our survival, and I hope we will thrive too. So what are the five transformational policies? So we don't have, we don't have 17, we only have five, which need to be focused on for the past, for the next 10, 11 years, 10 years in the meantime. So everything that you do should fit in here. One, accelerated renewable energy growth, Number two, accelerated productivity in food chain. We need to feed the people on this planet. Number three, new development models. So we need to copy what was right in the models developed by China, North, uh, uh, South Korea, uh, Japan, and others. What have they done right to help those who are currently developing? Of course, we need to reduce inequality. Um, this is something that I, you know, I do it in my own little way, but I'm not a politician. And here's number five. This is where education falls. This is what we're doing right now. This is why this is so important. The role of education, particularly as it applies to gender equality, to women and family planning. The difference between an educated woman and one that is not educated, educated 12 years of education and one that is not, is 4.5 children. That's the impact of education in terms of footprint. And of course, my intention is, uh, what is the key to transformation? And you all have the answer. What is it? A mind shift. Today, we have e economy at the bottom instead of biosphere, and the society is somewhere in nowhere. So we need to tip it to go upside down. Education must support this. And here is, um, before I ask the what, uh, what is the mind shift? Uh, what does it, how do we get there? And here is an example. Uh, that's why you know, I went back and got my PhD in psychology because I wanted to know what makes us function. Maslow Pyramid, most people know it, and of course, this is evolution. This takes time. Those of you who have children or no children know how difficult that is because it's only at the top of the pyramid that we have a world-centric mindset. As long as we're at the bottom, we're egocentric, ethnocentric, not much will change because we'll protect ourselves and our own interests and not the world, not the planet. So this is hard work. However, we do implement it. I do implement it. I in, we integrate traditional investing with traditional philanthropy. This is, this is the schizophrenia right there. And if you look at what's happening since the 1980s, impact investing came along and tried to integrate it. But within impact investing themselves, you have schizophrenia. So, oh, financial first. No, impact first. And the truth. The truth is integral investing is everything. The parity, I love to use them, use the six Ps, the parity of people, planet, and profit with passion and purpose, because you, yourself, is also important. And of course, the future or role of education. Um, I actually brought along, and I'd like to finish with that, a quote um, that I, that I read recently in a recent conversation on artificial intelligence with, uh, with Elon Musk, Alibaba's founder, Jack Ma, stated that he is quite optimistic about the future. Ma insisted that only college people are scared of AI. <laughs> Street smart people like him are not, Ma continued. AI can help people gain more self-confidence because through it, they could begin to understand themselves and each other better. When people know themselves better, they will be smarter and they will be wiser. And with that, they can begin to improve the world and make life more, more uh, sustainable, unquote. In response to Jack Ma, Elon Musk, who Believe that, believes that humanity is a biological bootloader for digital superintelligence. He's very worried about AI, so am I. Um, he said, famous last words, referring to Jack Ma. 
And um, I personally believe, and we could talk about this over lunch, uh, that both are right. I believe that, um, it, yes, the answer is consciousness evolution. And the answer is we need to collectively decide what's good for our planet and use AI to become, to be beneficial rather than destroy us. So, yes, I applaud uh, Elon Musk who's taking the Mona Lisa maybe to Mars if we destroy it, um, if we destroy it on this planet. But I, I believe in the meantime, we have so much to do and um, I'm deeply grateful to be in this group uh, because um, we, can, we can do it, we can all do it. There's so much collective intelligence here and more, more than intelligence, more than cognitive intelligence, uh, there's so much heart and um, it's an honor and a privilege and I thank you for your time. Thank you. I, I think that we postpone any question to the end of the presentation so we pass immediately to uh, Dr. Alberto Folletti that uh, uh, Dr. Alberto Folletti is uh, a, a physician with a, a deep experience on uh, the biophysical approach and uh, we present the impact of digital transformation on medical education and personal well-being. Alberto. The floor Thank is you here. very much for the organizer of the very amazing conference I have the privilege to attend. Thank you to the chairman. So, but not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. Yeah. This is recommendation of my previous yeah. speaker. Did, did you copy it? And digital transformation has certainly impacted almost all areas of modern lifestyle. Digital implication and application are not more negligible even in the area of health and well-being, and therefore in the area of medical education. Moreover, the concept of health and disease themselves need to be redefined in order to update efficaciously and efficiently medical education in regard of prevention and therapy. Addition, the concept of medical education is to be transformed and take it into account a dynamic transforming relationship between people and health professionals. At the beginning of my profession, it was 30 years ago, uh, the doctor was at the hub of the pyramid, but now we sit together and we have mutual interaction in which we have to decide joining together our path to follow. So the doctor itself is becoming an adv a medical advisor, let's say. So we have to reconsider this point in education in all area related to uh, health profession. Indeed, for both People and health professional digital transformation provides some new interesting opportunities. Easy and reliable access to general information, scientific database, such as uh, uh, forum and communities, research gate, for instance, in the scientific communities. And technological digitalized interface and to collect some biophysical parameters related to health and well-being are quickly growing providing real-time multi-parameter and multi-scale evaluation of some uh, relevant feature, quality of sleep, cool number of uh, work uh, that uh, people have around the days and so on. Most of these interfaces are built into so-called smart phones, uh, smart watches, <coughs> which are widespread enough to be considered as ordinary companion in daily life for most people in modern societies and almost independently from the level of development of countries or the you know, different social classes. Such a deep transformation in most people's habits worldwide presents some new challenges and opportunities at once 
and should deeply impact medical education in order to optimize prevention and therapy as much as possible in agreement with the emerging P4 medicine, suggested that healthcare should be preventive, predictive, personalized, and participative. Uh, one example of the implementation of such a augmented reality, a virtual reality, is for instance such a recent development of the technology uh, based on virtual reality that allows to young uh, people with the cerebral palsy to ameliorate the range of movement of the wrist and is a trick to assign a, a some kind of gamification to this process allows to boost this movement. And uh, it is my personal opinion that this kind of uh, new technology should allow to provide new horizon, not only in the field of rehabilitation, but for instance, in the field of well-being. So uh, most of people should don't know, uh, go anymore to the gym to keep in shape, for instance, or elderly people can, took advantage of uh, Tai Chi, Qigong at home, for instance. That would be new widespread possibility that would be at the same time time sparing, money sparing, and foot carbon sprint sparing. Digital transformation could not only foster a change of paradigm in healthcare encompassing biophysical features, but could afford its realization as well through bioelectromagnetic medicine. That is based on the possibility to exchange information through new biophysical devices. I would like to pay a tribute to a scientist of this country the scientific man do not aim to an immediate result. He do not expect that these advanced ideas will be readily taken up. His work is like the planter for the future. His duty is to lay the foundation for those who are to come and point the way. But I wanted to make some conclusion uh, since in this uh, meeting there are so many inspiring intuition. So I see that there are lots of unmet educational needs that affect personal well-being, inducing uh, struggle in the life task and inducing uh, stress overload that increase the biological cost of adaptation we have to pay in our life each day. It is the basis for any pathology. If you want really to spare money, since uh, the, the country spend a lot of the, the income to provide health care, we have to pay attention to this uh, point. And I see as a medical doctor that there is a, a great lack of education in regard of emotional intelligence, communication intelligence, parental intelligence. You need a driving license to drive a car, but you are allowed to have as many children you want. And uh, sometimes it's a disaster, not only for the children, but only for the uh, health state of the parents. So social intelligence also need to be uh, educated, ecological intelligence, of course, financial intelligence. This is, this is a very neglected point, but this affects very heavily the struggle for life of so many people that this impact their health status. And uh, moral intelligence. That should be the way to build the bridges all between these uh, relevant uh, points. 
this way we can we can remake such the sense of coherence we lack so many time and leads to some other pathology both from personal and social viewpoint so the final question is which are the hallmarks of humanity we need to educate humans or workers or consumers so i want to conclude with this uh, quote the best way to predict our, your future is to create it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Alberto. So next speaker is uh, Jeliko uh, Milut Milutinovic, that is from com uh, computer, uh, Department of Computer Science, Indiana University, that will present digital disruption as opportunity for business development. So. The floor is yours. Well, I'm here today to tell you about the course that I'm um, teaching this academic year at the University of Indiana in Bloomington, together for, with my other supercomputing course. Uh, I've been teaching there for about four years now since I retired from the University of Belgrade. Actually, I'm to talk about an experiment which started two decades ago, meaning that at the end I will be able to tell you also about uh, the conclusions coming out of the experiment. As I have said, everything started about two decades ago when an ex-student of the School of Electrical Engineering donated uh, monies to the School of Electrical Engineering, an equivalent of today's uh, about one million dollars. Well, that money was uh, uh, well used for the improvement of the environment, both teaching and uh, research. And uh, the faculty decided to come up with a course that would help maximize the probability that uh, uh, the same or similar event happens again in the future. They decided that I be the one who teaches that course simply because after my PhD in Belgrade, I spent uh, over a decade as a professor at Purdue University in West Lafayette, Indiana, USA. And then I came back before Bar Mitzvah, my uh, oldest uh, uh, son. Well, at first, uh, I uh, looked around to see if there is something similar to find out uh, at uh, MIT or uh, Stanford or the major US schools, which I was not able to. So I decided to create an own course with the help of the colleagues. And uh, the course has been placed in the context of uh, the management of sophisticated uh, projects, not only in academia or industry, but also in, in the lifetime. Uh, everything starts uh, with um, how to generate um, uh, resources and knowledge needed for the project to start at this line. Uh, so this is why here I teach about uh, the funding sources in uh, Europe and the USA, or USA and Europe, depending on where I teach. And also, uh, I tell them about an MBA uh, a short MBA uh, course which I took at uh, MIT from the Sloan School of Management, just what is important for the students there, and also I tell them uh, how to prepare if they like to study abroad. Then assuming that the project is funded, I teach them how to use the DARPA CMMI methodology for strategic planning and uh, an agile methodology for day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week planning. Uh, then, assuming that the project will result uh, in a market product or service, I tell them uh, how uh, to apply for uh, investment monies using the SBA methodologies, United States Small Business Administration methodology, and then how to protect their uh, know-how using the PTO methodologies, the United States Patent and Trademark Office. I teach them how to uh, 
generate survey papers or research papers, which might help them if they like also to, to become PhDs. I tell them how to disseminate uh, their knowledge, their know-how uh, through electronics, and how to bring people using the mind genomics methodologies developed recently at Harvard by Howard Moskowitz. Finally, with lots of math, I teach them how to f uh, look for hidden knowledge in what they have created uh, during the years behind, and uh, again, using lots of math on how to uh, generate brands out of what they have done. Using two famous books from Harvard by Lloyd and Drucker, I tell them about effect effectiveness and efficiency, and then uh, using uh, the slides of two Nobel laureates who visited Belgrade, uh, I tell them about inventivity and creativity methods. So uh, basically this course can be treated as an import uh, from Serbia uh, to United States, to a, a one of the top 10 universities of United States for informatics and one of the top two for online MBA. Uh, both types of students are eligible. So, week uh, after week, for 12 weeks, students get uh, homework assignments. And then I also teach about the efficiency, effectiveness, inventivity, creativity through their work, and then ethics and aesthetics, with some case studies. Well, here I have more details, which of course I will skip. Uh, the details are from a two-hour introductory le le lecture uh, about um, Survey papers, I teach them from a paper of mine, which you can find if you go to Google and type uh, the best method. And then you get about one million hits, and one of those is the paper. Uh, luckily, the first one. Uh, the methodology of writing survey papers, I uh, teach uh, after another paper of mine published uh, at, at I, an IEEE journal, which is what you can find easily if you type good method and then you get about one billion hits and one of those is the paper, hopefully, actually, luckily the first one. Uh, this is more about um, the other things that I just mentioned. And I stress a lot uh, on the idea generation methods uh, where the basis is a joint paper uh, generated by 30 faculty members of the School of Electrical Engineers Department of uh, Computer Engineers. Uh, each one is accompanied with uh, many examples and some anecdotics. Uh, then we look into what the Turing Award uh, uh, laureates uh, have done as far as what method of creativity they use. We also look into the methods of creativity behind uh, the uh, work of 10 Nobel laureates with whom we cooperated on writing joint books together. And, um, and then I ask the students to think two decades, two decades ahead of time. So let me tell you about what uh, had happened two decades later, meaning during this year and the previous year. I will mention only uh, four of the students of mine, only the four that uh, now claim publicly that on all these lectures they were sitting always in the first line. Uh, the four, but not only the four, turned out to be a lot wiser and a lot more effective than myself, which was a pleasure for myself. One of them generated uh, a company worth uh, several dozen million dollars entirely made out of Serbian brain. And uh, he's the only owner. The other one, Nenad Mirchevsky, Dan Mirchevsky, co-created a company which uh, a few months ago was sold for uh, over $1 billion. You can easily Google and Deca. The third one, Oscar Menzer, is now in the court case uh, with the major computing companies of the world uh, and threatening to overpass what is currently uh, the highest patent 
settlement on the planet of all times. Well, the fourth one to mention is currently the owner and the author of the highest patent settlement of all times on the planet, worth $2.4 billion. His name is Alec Kavčić. Especially the last one, I think, is an extremely wise man. He did an, an interesting experiment one month ago. Around a, a lecture in the uh, major hall of the Montenegrin Academy of Arts and Sciences, uh, he also uh, signed a contract with the Prime Minister of, of Montenegro to do an experiment. He believes uh, among the issues in, of uh, the major importance for the best future of a nation are not the teachers at the university level, neither researchers in institutes or research labs. He believes the most important people for the mission are those that teach preschool kids, vertici, elementary school, K-8, and high school. So what he decided was, and uh, what he had put into the pre-contract with the government of Montenegro, was um, to set aside $10 million uh, uh, from his wealth, uh, which means that uh, banks would generate about 800000 uh, per year uh, as long as his foundation lives, which he hopes to be a lot uh, more than his personal life. And uh, he likes uh, to use that money to double the salaries of uh, teachers in Vertici, in preschools, one to five, in K to eight, and in high schools. Uh, the problem, uh, he believes, is that uh, these pillars of education are underpaid and uh, living on relatively low levels of the social econ social economical ladders in uh, a number of nations, at least in all those in Western Balkans. So by doing what he has decided to do, by doubling his, uh, their uh, earnings, he hopes to help in a way which he believes is the most vital. Thank you.